All right. So um, I was I was kind of reading through the Bible this past week and trying to just come up with something encouraging for you guys. And it was kind of hard to do because I'm not an encouraging kind of guy. I like ripping people's face off and you know, making people feel really bad and upbraid them for the unbelief, all kind of good stuff. And, you know, as Baptist preachers, we're good at that. We're not used to lifting up people up and preaching. We kind of tear down, root up, build about, you know, pluck down, destroy. But the Bible tells us in all that we're supposed to build up as well. So some of you might get helped by this. Some of you may not. We'll try it anyway. <laughs> Just kidding. Psalms chapter 141. I want to preach here empty, but yet empty, yet full. And uh, I want to show you verse number one. Lord, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So he says, hey, while I'm, I'm going to sacrifice my prayer and my prayer unto you, there's things that I want to just bring before you. And it's kind of interesting because there's, there was a morning, there's a morning sacrifice and there was an, after, an evening sacrifice. And there's a lot of times we, you know, through our day, we'll, we'll spend time in our prayer the first thing in the morning. But having that time where we come to God at the end of the day and saying, Lord, if there's been any sin in my life, if I've sinned, you know, get it right with God. The Bible tells us we ought not let the sun go down upon our wrath. So if someone has offended you, let's say Melissa, or let's be honest, let's say Brother Ed has offended us and has done something against us, like Brother Gabriel often does. The Bible says that what we're, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to forgive them. We're supposed to let it settle. We're supposed to give that to God and let not the sun go down upon your wrath, the Bible says in Ephesians. So we ought to, we ought to you know, it's good to have morning devotions. Amen. It's something, something special about getting up with the Lord and, and spending time in, in prayer and Bible reading and get God in our hearts and, and focus on him first thing throughout the day. But then sometimes it's good to do it at evening too and have a clear, clean, hot, a clear, clean conscience before God. But David understands some things. I'm going to point out a couple things here about David in his life. But as he's seeking out the Lord's help, you know, he, he seeks out the Lord's help in times of trouble. And see, he was empty. He had empty. He was without himself. He couldn't do anything. Yet he was full because he had God's presence. He was full because I, be, I do believe that David had the Holy Spirit of God inside him. I don't believe the Holy Spirit of God ever left David. I believe that the Holy Spirit of God was with David and his presence was, was, was with David. I don't believe his present, the Holy Spirit's presence ever would leave a believer. I, don't, I just don't see... I don't, see, I don't see it in there, but David's response to trouble in verses 1 through 2 was that when he came to trouble in his life, he would seek out the Lord's help. Here he was in the cave. Here he was on the run. He was, on the, he was hiding from Saul. I believe this is where he was running, running from Saul. And he came and he was in the cave. And the Bible says that he, he says, I will seek the Lord's help. If, that's, if I can say that loosely, David came to resolve that in the time of trouble, when he came to a time of, of difficulty, he said, I will seek the Lord's help. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do in our life, and it, and it demonstrates where we are in our Christian life of how we, result, how we react to trouble, how we react to stress. There's times in my life that I don't rehandle the stress very well at all. I have, I have times where I get frustrated. I was in the hospital this past couple weeks ago, and Brother Ed came up. I don't let anybody know where I was at. I didn't want anybody to come visit me. I didn't want anybody coming up and posting Instagram pictures of me in a hospital gown. I didn't want anybody knowing my business. I didn't want people. I didn't want it. I didn't want anybody to know where I was at, but Brother, Brother Ed figured it out. I didn't have to tell. He just figured it out. He came by and harassed me, and... Uh, you got a friend, but um, he's but uh, brother, but brother had came by and visited me, and I was I was beside myself about some things, and I was frustrated about a couple things, and brother Ed says, you know what, you you need to stop. You're you're not acting in the, you're acting in the, you're acting in the flesh. You're not acting in the spirit. The man rebuked me right there in the hospital. Here I was in my sick bed, on my deathbed, practically dead, and he comes up and starts rebuking me to my face. I tell you what. But there's times when you come to trouble, how long does it take to you to get to a place of prayer? When trouble comes upon you, how long does it take for you before you respond, before you respond in prayer? What is, the, what is the gap? Even Paul, when he was in, in Philippi, the Bible says that he was, he was, uh, he was beaten, he, was, he was received stripes, he was whipped. And the Bible says that he was put in the prison, in the innermost part of the prison. And then it says about midnight. And around midnight, he prayed. And I find that so encouraging to me because even Paul, the great apostle Paul, the great preacher, the great, the great servant of God, still had a time of his life where he, around midnight, prayer and sing, had prayer and sang praises to God. 
So there's times, and no matter, it, but the thing is, it's, it's not that you don't pray, it's the fact of how long does it take you to get to prayer. That gauges our spiritual growth, okay? So here's our response to trouble. Our first response to trouble ought to be that we pray. Prayer habits have to be developed, and we need to spend time in prayer and have prayer habits. When we have prayer time on Wednesday nights or even on Sunday school, it's okay. We ought, to, we ought to be praying. I'm not saying put on a show. We're not trying to show off to people. But our prayer time at home is reflected in our public prayer. I mean, Elijah, Elijah only prayed 53, 63 words and fire fell from heaven. But the fact is he spent three and a half years in prayer. And it doesn't have to be the longest prayer in the world, but your prayer is how you get a hold of God. And your prayer is how God is, hears from you. Your prayer life is more important than your Bible reading schedule. No, I'm not, don't get me wrong. I appreciate, I think we ought to read the Bible. The Bible says, search your scriptures. The Bible says, I word have I hid in my heart. But nowhere in the Bible to say, thou shalt read the Bible. It says we're supposed to meditate in his word. But nowhere in the Bible to say to read the Bible three, every, 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 every day for a year. It does tell us to pray. It says pray without ceasing. So a lot of times we put things in focus. Look what I've accomplished. I've read the word of God through. I read the New Testament through in 30 days. Wow, good for you. I'm having a hard time reading the Old Testament through in 90. I'm just reading so much. I'm like, oh, wow, it's over. It's like I'm getting so much out of it. And I don't want to rush through because I'm just finding so much stuff in there. But uh, I'm having a hard, you know, trying to read your Bible through in a year. That's, that's admirable. We ought to read our Bible. We ought to be people who read the Bible. We ought to be people who spend time knowing the Word of God. It's okay to memorize Scripture. We were playing the Bible trivia game, and Gabriel's back, and on the game night we played, and Gabriel's back there, and he's like memorizing, and going through and memorizing, you know, Proverbs, Proverbs 3, I think it was, Proverbs 3 or whatever, and he's like, da -da 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 -da. I'm like, oh, come on. Yes, there is. Ask Daniel. Give him $5. He'll tell you a whole laundry list. Like laundry, amen. <laughs> but um, but David, our first response ought to be when we come to trouble. It ought to it, it, it reveals our our walk with God, and we ought to be people of prayer. We ought to be people who get a hold of God. We can read the Bible, and you can be an encyclopedic knowledge, and that's good for you. Lost people can read the Bible, but the difference is, lost people can't get a hold of heaven. We as believers can. We have access before the Father. When we pray, our prayers can be answered. God doesn't hear the prayer of the lost. The only prayer of the lost that God will ever hear is, Lord, save me. The prayer of asking, the prayer of faith is the only prayer that God will ever hear of a lost person. God doesn't hear those who reject him, who don't appreciate, who don't love his word. So, but God hears our prayers. That's how important prayer is. And I encourage you guys, you can never exhaust your prayer life. You can never get to a place where you say, you know what? I've prayed through every day this year. I'm good to go. We can spend in, in, uh, an, uh, an entire multitude of sermons and, and time upon time of learning to pray. I've learned this past year to pray a lot. I've learned back to praying and, and spending a lot of time in prayer. And I've got, you know, I get to drive the Amish around, so I get to drive the backcountry roads at night, and I pray, Lord, keep those deer away. But, um, you know, there's a lot of times you're praying for different things. I'm telling you, Prayer, it increases your faith, and it teaches you things about yourself. We think we're okay. We think we're disciplined, man. We don't smoke. We don't chew. We don't, we don't hang with folks that do. Good for you. But what about when we go before God and we're going to confess our sins before God, and we stand, bef we stand before God thinking we're justified, when we really get down and start naming our sins in, pers in, in private, it reveals just where our, shortcoming, where, where our sins are. It reveals how shortcomings our character is. But having a prayer life teaches us discipline. If I had my druthers, if I had a choice between a church full of people who read their Bible every day or people who read their Bible every, you know, they read their Bible faithfully, but it was, even if it wasn't every day, they didn't read it through an entire year. If they read their Bible through every day, but yet they had a strong prayer life, I would rather have a church full of prayer warriors than I would have a, pe a bunch of people who can quote and memorize verses. Because prayer is actually putting it to practice. When we stand before God, when I, when I, come, into a, when I come to a place of trouble, I got a hold of some, some friends of mine this past week, and I said, hey, I need you to pray about this specifically. I didn't call the people who could quote Bible verses to me. I didn't quote the people who were winning 500 people to the Lord every year. I didn't get a hold of people who could quote, you know, who could, you know, read the Bible through six times in a year. I got a hold of people I know who prayed that could get a hold of God on my behalf. 
I want to be that kind of a person when a person comes to me for prayer that I have gotten a hold of heaven for them. And I have prayed through. My father-in-law says that. You've got to pray through. It's not just praying and just kind of repetition, praying something, but you pray until you get a hold of God. You get in there in the prayer closet and you wrestle with God like Jacob did until God gives you the blessing. To the break of day, you pray through. You fight and you wrestle and you hold on to the promises of God and you get a hold of God and say, God, I will not let go until you bless me. That's praying through. And then not letting go before God does. Pray through. Pray through. Our first response to trouble is that it reveals, it ought to be that we pray, but it reveals our, our prayer habit. The more familiar you are with prayer before trouble comes determines how you will pray when it comes. Guy Goodell, my, my pastor friend of mine said that. There's more the more familiar you are with prayer before trouble comes determines how you will pray when it comes. Okay, my daughter's in the hospital. She's you know, got some kind of crazy lung infection or she's got some blood infection. She, she needs 48 hours where she's going to die. And I get before the Lord and I sit there, Lord, thank you for this day. I'm thank you for this food. I mean, not this food. Lord, uh, help me, Lord. Just, uh, Lord, j Lord, I just thank you, Lord. Uh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for Lord uh, the day, Lord. And uh, thank you for letting us gather together, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Lord. That just reveals that I don't have a good prayer life. But when I can pour out my heart before the Lord, when you can pray out your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, these are the petitions I have. You read the book of Psalms, and you read how rich David's prayer life was. He didn't have a Bible carrying around with him. He didn't, carry, he didn't have a King James under his arm carrying around the Bible. You know what he did have? He had a prayer life. Enoch walked with God. He didn't have the Bible. You know what he had? He had a knowledge of God. He had a fear of God, and he had a prayer life. The more familiar you are, the more when, the more familiar you are familiar you are with prayer, it tells you how you're going to handle prayer when the problems come. Okay, number two, you need to have you know what well, number next? I should say in this in the same vein, you need to develop. You, we need to develop prayer principles. There are four parts of prayer. Five technically, but I'll use four. There's four principles. I forgot one. I only wrote down four. So there's four principles of prayer. <laughs> It's inspiration. The inspired version is only four points. The five is just, you know, man-made. But um, these are developed prayer principles in your life. Number one is praise. Enter God's throne with praise. Come before him with singing. Come before him in accolade of who he is. And worship him for his being. Worship him for his character. Worship him for his, for his awesome, wonderful deeds. But come before him with praise. Then go before him for pardon. Go before him for pardon and ask God for pardon for our sins. Sins that we commit and sins we don't commit. The sin, you know, things that think, for things that we do and things that we don't do. We need to spend time in asking God, Lord, I don't know I was supposed to go to church this past week, but I had other things. Lord, I know I got this. Or Lord, I... No, go to God with prayer. Go to God with, with our asking God to pardon us for our sins, for the things that when we mess up. Go before God and ask him. Go to him and him alone. David said when I sinned, when he sinned with Bathsheba and killed off Uriah, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. When we sin, it's against God and God alone. Are other people affected? Infected by our sins? Absolutely. But it's against God and God alone. And our, when it comes to our sin, only God needs to hear our sin in confession to him. That's it. But then you also notice there's petitions. When you pray, there's petitions. You bring up the, you bring up the question of what you're asking for. You're asking the Lord for the things. It may be for you. It could be suppl supplication for praying for other people. But you're bringing before these prayer requests. And that, that ought to take time. We ought to pray for other people's requests like it's our requests. Miss Deborah asked specifically, specifically for a prayer for unspoken, and she said, keep it there and pray for it until I tell you otherwise. That's a pretty diligent prayer request. I don't know what it is. I don't have to know what it is. It's an unspoken, but I'm going to pray for that one specific request before the Lord like it's my own. Do you know why? Because I want, I want someone to pray for me like it's their own. We got to pray and have petitions. We got to go before God for those things and ask a request. Hey, give God the glory in our prayer life. We got to give God, you know, we had to, we had to part, ask for pardon for our sins. We need to, you know, um, we can claim God's promises. That's another P if you want to put it in there. But you can, you can have more, you know, petition God for our requests. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. But then before, when you walk out that door, before you walk out that closet, before you walk out that prayer closet, 
I'm not talking about the other kind of closet. Before I walk out the prayer closet, before you get, go out there and face the world, you thank God and you worship God on the way out. If someone comes to me and all they say is, oh, man, you're the best ever, man. Wow, what a guy. What a guy. Man, you're such a great, always dependable. Okay? I'm like, okay, what do you need? Get on with it because I don't feel it. I'm not feeling the love. I don't feel it sincere. And then you can tell because as soon as they get the petition, they're out. They're out they forget about how great of a guy I was. And what if, I, what if God tells us no in our prayer life? Are we going to thank God anyway? Are we going to give him the glory anyway because God says no to our prayer? Are we going to give God the glory just the same? Paul did. Paul said, I besought the Lord three times for this thing that I'm asking you. I've asked for this thorn in the flesh to be removed three times. I believe it was a father-in-law. He asked, three, he asked for this thorn in the flesh to be removed three times. And God said, no, my, in, in your weakness, I'm made strong. My, my, you know, your, your, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. He says, look, at I, something like that in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to remove that thorn. I'm going to give you grace through it. I'm going to be here for it, but that's going to bring me more glory by that. And it came to a place where Paul had to just rejoice and thank God for that. We need to come to that time where we, re, where we just rejoice and give God glory for him saying no. There was a song playing on the radio, and I was driving back from Columbus this past week, and I was listening to the radio, and I can't tell anymore if it's country, if it's rap, if it's... It was a song being played, and I was like, okay, whatever. And the song said, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. I was like, let me think about that. That's actually really wise. You know, some of the great, God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers, and I found it was a country song. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I repent for listening to country. But it was, a good, it, was a, it was a good thought for a minute there. Sometimes God answers our no. God answers our prayers. Sometimes it's the answer is no. It's not that he doesn't answer our prayers. He just says no. He's not a genie in the lamp somewhere that we got to rub and out comes a genie God, and he says, what can I give you today, cosmic genie? Yes, okay. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. Yes, sir. God's not a cosmic genie. We don't, he doesn't exist to please us. We exist to please him. All right? So we had to develop prayer principles. We had to make sure you exit the door, enter and exit the door through praise. And by the way, you can take the same, the same, uh, you can take the same, uh, these points and find them with Jesus' model prayer when he prays, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day to the that, that whole model prayer, Jesus teaches us praise, pardon, petition, praise. And you can also add in claiming the promises of God. You can, you can claim the promises of God. Sure, go ahead and do it. Number two, well, he says, I will seek the Lord's help. He recognized his own limits. He recognized his own limits. People of prayer are not independent minded. You know, it's okay to be have an independent thought. It's okay not to have to follow the crowd. It's okay to have a free thought. If I sit here and said, okay, Pepsi, 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 Coke, every, most of the people here would be like, oh, you know, I'm going to get a Pepsi. But some people are like, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and go get a Coke. Or if I were to say water, 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 coffee, we know Brother Robert's going to get coffee. <laughs> That's just guaranteed it's going to happen like there. But so many times we go through our life, we're gonna go, we, we, get, we go through trouble. It's okay for us to take, the, take you know, what other people do. We don't have to be the cutting edge. If, so, if, if everybody wears blue and you say, well, I'm not going to wear blue, well, we're black, just for the principle of the matter. Being a rebel without cause is not being independent thought. You're just being a rebel without cause. Okay? It's okay to, be independent, to have independent thought while following the advice of others. Okay, David said here, here, David had recognized his own limits. People of prayer are not independent minded. We are dependent on God. Well, I can do it my way. Well, you're not of God. You're not, you're not acting in the spirit. You're acting in the flesh. You can't do it your way. In my own self, we can do nothing. In my own, in my, and I know in my heart, do dwell no what? Good thing. Okay, what about your heart? <laughs> I know it's in my heart. What's in your heart, right? But we can have the same thing, but he recognized his own limits. He recognized his own limitations. You can find, um, that's part of all point number one. And number three, when it comes to developing principles, or our response to trouble, excuse me, he experienced God's protection and deliverance and victory. 
He was waiting on God's protection and delivery. He was waiting on God for that. It says in verse number four, um, Psalms 141, verse one, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear to my voice. When I cry unto thee, let my, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and in the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. He says, I'm lifting up my voice. I'm, and he says, I'm lifting up my voice. And God, I'm asking you, the God who hears and answers prayers, I'm asking you to listen to me. And he claims the promises of God that, we, when he, that God hears the prayer of his children. All right? So you've got to, but you've got to, you've got to set in, um, you've got to have those right responses to trouble. Number two, um, not only did David's response was, I will seek the Lord's help, but number two, he says, I will keep myself from sin. I know I said number two before, but bear with me. I don't write very good outlines. Look at verse number three and four. So major point number two. I will keep myself from sin. Look what David says in verse number three. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. He's not sitting here like put a Timex. Can you imagine? He's not asking God to put a Timex before his face, you know, ticking him off. He's not what he's asking for. He's asking uh, someone to guard his lips, to guard his mouth, to put, you know, to, to guard what he says, to guard his lips, to guard his thoughts. He says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Help me to shut up. On the way back from so many we were talking, and uh, I think it was First Hezekiah 9, 14, 9. It says, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says, sit down and shut up. There's a missionary, his daughter came, they're coming to our church, and they're visiting, and, and uh, his daughter was up there, and she goes, I want to teach Sunday school. All you kids sit down. And there was like two kids, and she goes, okay. I was just, you know, pretending to have church. She goes, I'm the Sunday school teacher. I'm like daddy. My daddy preaches. He says, the Bible says, sit down and shut up. And she meant it. Sit down and shut up. I'm not sure exactly where in the chapter that is, but that's what she told the kids. It was great fun. Sit down and shut up. But he says here, keep the door of my lips. Or some people say, shut the front door. <laughs> I, I kind of find that kind of funny. Verse number four, they say it in the South. Keep, oh, shut your front door. Verse number four, incline not my heart to do any, to any evil thing, to practice wicked work, works with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. He's like, look, keep me from trouble. He says, I will keep myself from sin. And then he says, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. And he's asking God to help him to keep him from sin. I think that is a lost art in independent Baptists. To maintain our own integrity, not in go, got involved with other people's sins, to shut up and keep ourselves from sin. From keeping ourselves from taking the dog by the ears. It's easy for us to get involved. It's so easy. Internet's out there. 20 years, you tell me 10 years ago, I'll put it this way. Facebook wasn't really, didn't really start getting big and social media didn't get, really start getting pushed up until the past couple, what, five years. When Jack Scott messed up, it, did, it still didn't have as much tread. Could you imagine what it, what it would have been like if Bob Gray from Jacksonville, Florida, if he, you know, messing, messing so many kids, if social media was, in, was enforced like it is today? I mean, Pastor Shiflet gets up and exposes a, a guy who's, who messed around in the pulpit and violated so many young people, and he gets up there and he exposes it, and he's getting blacklash because, oh, how dare you bring it up? How can you touch God's anointed? Well, I'm God's anointed, and I'm telling against God's anointed. This guy's wicked. Well, could you imagine the blowback from that, what would happen 15, 20 years ago? But there's so many people who got involved 15, 20 years ago of things that didn't even matter to them, and it's happening today, and we need to learn from social media. Pastor Burson's preached a couple sermons about how the Christian's responsibility is toward social media. Those are some really powerful sermons. Pastor Burson's is like, I don't want to mess it. If it doesn't involve me, I'm keeping out of it. And he wasn't putting his head in the sand. He was just like, I'm not getting involved. It doesn't involve me. It's so easy for us to sin nowadays, isn't it? It's easy, and I'm not just talking about things we're not supposed to watch, but things we're not supposed to read. It's easy for us to get involved with things that aren't our strife. It's not for us to get involved in. It's not our business. It is so easy, and David says way back, he says, put a watch over my mouth. Help me not to do these things. I don't want to sin. I don't want to mess around with the workers' iniquity. Protect me from that. I'm asking for your help and protection. 
That ought to be our response. When we stop believing God, we scheme. When we stop believing God and taking him at his word and asking him to protect us, we start scheming. How can I get, my, how can I get out of this situation by my own self? I wonder what would happen if Jacob had actually continued in prayer life before he messed around with having, you know, trying to get, you know, figure out Laban with, with Leah and Rachel and then the cattle for 21 years. But he's always a schemer, always scheming. It wasn't until after he exited, after he left Uncle Laban, after he got out of that whole mess, after he was on his own, and he, started, he, got, be, he got before the angel of the Lord and wrestled with the angel of the Lord in Peniel. Until that point, he was a schemer, always scheming. A lot of times when we get into trouble, we ask ourselves this, how can I get out of this instead of what can I get out of this? What lessons can I learn out of this? But no, instead we're asking, how can I get out of this situation? How can I get out of this time of testing? How can I get out of this trouble? Sometimes troubles is not what we get in because we're misbehaving. Sometimes troubles is what we get in because other people put us into it. You never go door knocking and get a hold of it. The dog is, the, you, know, like, you know, here's a dog on this side. And you're like, man, what am I supposed to do? And the dog's about, you know, he's going to get you. You're like, run off the door. You, you get yourself, you get yourself, that never happens, by the way, for those who don't go soul winning. That never happens. Never happens. But uh, I remember one time I was out door knocking with my friend Ernest. We were out doing this trailer park in Virginia. And uh, we were out there. And Ernest was like 150 pounds. I mean, he was wiry, a little kid. Not much. Five foot eight, 150 pounds. He wasn't much. He wasn't like really heavy. He was light. He seemed kind of like really like weak. Like he didn't have a lot of strength, you know, like not of the upper. And we're out there, and this guy is on a Friday night. And he's like, oh, you guys are cops. Maybe a desk cop. <laughs> I mean, that could be me right there. I get the donuts, you know. And this guy's going, oh, you guys are cops. I'm like 17, 18. He's like, you guys are cops. And he goes and he takes the, he goes and he takes the beer bottle and he crashes it the side of the trailer. And he starts flailing like this with an with a empty, you know, beer bottle. And he's cutting Jagger like this. And Ernest kind of goes like this. He kind of takes me, puts me back behind him. And he puts me over here. He does a spinning roundhouse and kicks the beer bottle out of the guy's hand. Broke, broke it in half. Kicked out the guy's hand. And the guy's like, whoa! Just kind of like, whoa! And I'm like, whoa! And he goes, sir, leave us alone. We're out doing church work. Pray for me! Pray for me! Sometimes we get into trouble, and the first thing we want to do is how we to get ourselves out of it. Sometimes the trouble we're in is not by our doing wrong. Sometimes it's we're doing right. But what is your response when you get into trouble? How can I get out of trouble? No, what can I learn in this trouble? How can I see God's faithfulness in this situation? For me to have a 150-pound 150 150 guy be a black belt in karate, jiu-jitsu, and taekwondo, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Woohoo! praise the Lord. I got me a garden angel. I don't know what's my life. He did as like, fast, as fast as I can be. He did a reverse spinning wheel, you know, reverse spinning roundhouse. Pow, pow. Kick the guy's like, Aah! it was awesome. I, I, I wish I could replay it in my mind with the guy. Look, it was awesome. But when you get into trouble, what can you get out of that trouble? You know, you never know. God, what God's going to get, look for what God's, look for the lessons we can learn in the troubles, okay? Number three. Look in verse number five and six of verse of chapter 141. He says, let the righteous smite me. Now, wait a second. David is asking for correction. Let the righteous smite me. If it, if it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, it shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony, in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. He's not asking to be killed by the righteous, okay? Smiting is two ways. Smiting him on the cheek, smack him upside the head. Or if you watch, if you watch TV, you watch NCIS, it's like a gib slap, you know? You know, kind of slap on the back of the head. That's what he's asking for. He's asking for a slap on the back of the head. He's asking to be smacked in the face. He's asking to be smite, to have his smiting. He says, let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. He's asking for correction. He's asking for 
he's asking for uh, correction in this. He's asking for, um, he's asking for counsel. He's actually seeking counsel. In verses 5 and 6, he actually says, hey, let them hear my words for they are sweet. He's asking for the judges that are overthrown. He says, they shall hear my words for they are sweet. He's asking for prayer and they're, you know, for the, in calamities. He says that they're, it, um, he's let them reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. So he's asking for, he's asking for correction. You can say it this way. He says, I will seek for counsel. When he came to trouble, he says, I'm going to seek for counsel. How many times we react, how many times do we react to something rather than respond? When trouble comes, we react. And when trouble comes, we just kind of fly off the handle, do things our own way. The Bible says we're not supposed to do it that way. We're supposed to trust in the Lord. We're supposed to have lean on him and let him control and let us let him dictate our thoughts. Let him dictate our our, our responses. Okay? She, the, she, you can look at this, and here's here's something that was also said. Um, Chief, uh, someone, someone said, I wrote my Bible one time, it says, chief characteristics of a godly person is their willingness to be judged and critiqued. You find someone who's a godly person, they want to be, be corrected and they want to increase in knowledge. You, you, you smite a scorner, what happens? It doesn't help a thing. You, you, you correct a fool, you brought a blot to yourself. You, it's a, you brought punishment to yourself. I know I'm butchering the passage there. But when you correct a wise man, he'll what? He'll receive in correction. A wise person is going to receive and is going to receive judgment or correction. And they're going to be willing to be critiqued. So, hey, I, know, I remember this one guy, he come, I had him preach for me a couple times. I was trying to develop him. I was trying to help him grow in the Lord. And he comes up and he started preaching really off-the-wall crazy stuff. I mean, stuff didn't matter a hell of beans. And it always resulted to him being a grown man, 40-something years old, and his parents still spanking him. I'm not kidding. And he'd sit there and he'd turn those butt. He'd start rubbing his butt in front of people. And uh, and we're like, and after a while we were like, stop doing that. But it always came to be, no matter what happened, he'd look and ask for, was that okay? Did I do okay? Did I do okay? And he sat back and he says, hey, okay, so how did I do? I said, I think he did flat out terrible. I'll tell you a reason why. And he says, okay. Well, next time I had him teach, or had him fill in for, for Sunday school one time, and I had him teach, and uh, he gave us the lousiest sermon. I mean, he gave him three weeks ahead of time for prep. Fell flat on his face. It was terrible. He says, so how'd I do? I said, I actually wrote critiques. I pulled out like eight pages of handwritten critiques. I just gave it to him. He goes, well, if I'm not good enough to teach, then I just won't do it anymore. I'm like, okay, probably a good thing then if you can't take correction. Because that was mass. That was a disaster. That wasn't even biblical. That wasn't even, that was, that was I mean, that was heresies looking at it and saying that was nonsense. <laughs> it was just so far gone removed. Like, what are you doing? Well, he got all blow, he got all bowed up about it. And, you know, you got, you got to be willing to take correction. You got to be willing to be critiqued. Now, I want to say this too. Take critique from the right sources. Take critique from the right sources. Let me give you some things about this. Troubles are tools. When we come to troubles, there are tools. Number one, here's some here's the tools that we have when it comes to troubles. Number one, open. We are, we need to be open to righteous confrontation. We need to be open to people who are righteous confronting us, and take that correction. That's a tool that God gives. The Bible says, "As iron sharpeneth iron, so does a man the countenance of his friend." Open rebuke is better than secret love. We ought to take correction. We ought to be willing to take that correction reproof. Let's just say, for instance, I know this would never happen because we never make mistakes. Let's just say that Brother Gabriel went to Brother Tim, and Brother Tim had messed up, okay? And he had, maybe he, he, he slipped up or didn't do something as good as he could have. And Brother Gabe says, hey, Brother Tim, can I show you something? This probably could have been handled a little bit better. Boy, who, who died and made you boss? Well, I tell you what, man. You ought to respect your elders, who do you think you are? Who died and made you pastor? And he just he could bow up and got all upset, and that's so easy for us to do. But it would be better for do is in that situation for Brother Tim to sit back and say, you know what? I'm gonna take righteous correction. I mean, for granted it is Brother Gabriel giving the correction. But we ought to give that, we ought to see that was a double-ended backslap. Would you like that? That was pretty good. But um, 
we gotta we gotta be we gotta take open correct we gotta be take righteous correction if it helps us grow in the grace of god it helps us grow in our tools to serve the lord we ought to take the correction i love correction i want to let me go i'm going to say this i love correction but if you're in my face screaming at me rolling up a bulletin and smack me in the nose that's not of god I can take correction, but it's got to be done the right way. The Bible says that we're supposed to entreat the elder as a father. It says that in Peter. So if I'm wrong, you're supposed to come to me and entreat me as if you're supposed to entreat me. You're supposed to be patient towards me. And I'm supposed to be, and I'm supposed to react the same way. But how many times, if you're trying to get up in front of a preacher and you're trying to correct the preacher, you're trying to tell the preacher he's wrong, and you're trying to do it, and well, I just think you're wrong. Well, I don't care what you think. We were in church one time, and this lady guy was preaching. I said, America is not a Christian nation anymore. It hasn't been for a long time. We say we're a Christian nation. I don't think we are. If we were a Christian nation, the society we live in would not make it so hard for a, single, for a husband to work a job, provide for his family without struggling Without even having, I'm not talking about the great big extravagances. I'm talking about it's hard for a, for a father for a husband to provide for his family, doing it biblically and not struggle. It almost forces women to the workplace. The society that we live in, it forces women to the workplace, and it ought not be. A woman's place ought to be taking care of their kids at home. That's a woman's place. When they have kids at home, their job is to take care of their kids at home. And I preach it just like that. Well, I don't care what the Bible says. This one, this lady spoke up. I don't care what the Bible says. I stopped. Looked at her. I'm sorry. It's just what I believe. I'm, so, I'm sorry. That's just what I believe. Just like that. That's how it went down like that. I said, okay, folks, let's dismiss. Closed my Bible, dismissed in prayer. Everyone's like, oh, man. I didn't have to correct her. She got corrected by the dead silence. <laughs> I didn't have to correct her. I'm going to call her down. But she's trying to correct me from the pulpit saying that women are supposed to. Well, what about nurses? Well, what about Teachers. The Bible says. Well, I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I believe. You don't care what the Bible says. She was a founding member of the church. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> I don't care what the Bible says. Okay, that says a lot. Did I remind, can I remind you that I pastored the church in Corinth? <laughs> I kid you not. It was the church at Corinth. It was messed up. We ought to take righteous confrontation, but... Let me tell you something, rolling up a bulletin, standing up and trying to correct me face to face. No, that's, that's not righteous. That's not righteous. All right, number two, we need to consider correction as an act of kindness. Look what it says in verse number five. Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. When we get corrected, it ought to be a kindness. I rejoice. I accept it. I, I am thankful Every time I go off on, a, if I start going off on a stupid rant or I start getting in a bad mood or whatever, I am thankful for a guy like Ed Dennison, who lovingly, kindly, kindly, he's got my back. I know he's got my best interest at heart. I don't have to worry about his, he's, his, he's faithful to the Lord. He comes along and says, Pastor, you don't need to have that attitude. You need to pray about it. How many times, if I could count, how many times, if I had a dollar for every time Brother Ed did that, I'd have enough money to buy everybody here a sprinkle. A sprinkle. That's right, man. I'm busting out the time. But I mean, he, he, as many times as he's been there, been benefit, you know, been patient and kind and entreated me and done, I've counted it as a kindness every time. There's been times Brother Gabriel has corrected me over stuff and he doesn't even recognize it. I'll never let him know what it is. But, um, but I consider it as an act of kindness. There's been times Brother Tim has, has corrected me lovingly. 
There's been times he's done. There's times, countless times, brother. I can count maybe 10 times so far, brother. Jeff has helped me with some stuff. It's a kindness. Number three, troubles are tools. Number three is ready to, we need to be ready to make a change when we see troubles. We need to be ready to make a change with things in our life when we see troubles as tools to make us stronger. That made no sense when I wrote it. Let me just go down to verse number four. When we see, when we see the tools and we see the correction, we need, to, we need to see the correction as assets, not liability. That's what I'm trying to say. We need to see troubles as assets and not a liability. Well, if I mess up, brother, it's going to get in my face. No, I'm thankful that I've got the asset, that I've got the tool in my bag, that if I mess up, I'm going to have a brother or sister in Christ pull me aside and say, hey, you blew it. You could have done it a lot better. Take it as an asset. Don't take it as a threat. We need to stop being so in, in, you know, insecure about ourselves. Number three. Number three on this mess, this outline here. Wait, that was number four. I will let God judge my enemy. Look at verse number six and seven. When their judges are overthrown in the stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered as the graves, um, at the grave's open mouth as, one, as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But my eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of their workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst I will... Whilst Whilst that I withal escape. He's asking here that God judges enemies. The Bible says vengeance belongs to God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will, I will repay. But how many times do we try borrowing that from God? Hey, God, can I borrow your vengeance for a couple weeks? Just for one instance, God. Let me at him. Let me at him. No, let God be the judge. Let God overthrow the wicked judges. Let God be the one who overthrows the wicked counsel. Verses 8 through 10, he says, But mine eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord, in thee, do I, in thee is my trust. Leave, me not, leave not my soul destitute. Let me, I'm oh, sorry, keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of their workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own, into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. He says, I will keep on going by faith. And it's this paraphrase, but he's saying here, I'll keep on going by faith. Living by faith isn't doing impulse, but what God's word says. Living by faith is not flying by the seat of your pants. If you're driving down the road and you're heading out into the country and your gas light comes on and you pass a gas station and you run out of gas because you don't stop, you're not living by faith. God provided a gas station for you right there. Stop and get gas. Sometimes, hey, why? Well, I just wish, I just wish I had how many times have it, has it been I've heard preaching, I've preached a message or something, and I, I don't know why God laid on the sermon in my heart. I led, and I preached this sermon, and I preached it what, God, what I believe God wanted me to preach, and I preached this message, and the person's not there. They come back that Sunday night or that Wednesday night and say, oh, I just need help. This one specific help in my area I'm having trouble with. And I'm like, I actually just preached on this Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, just preached on this. Where were you? Well, I just said, oh, so just said, oh, no, I just stayed at home and had family come in. And this, no, 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 no. God gave me a message for you, but you weren't here to get it. You want help from the pastor? I guarantee you that Monday, Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, somewhere in that message, if you need something from, if you need some advice, sometime during that time, I, I can almost promise you that sometime during that preaching, if it's something you're going through and you're asking God for help, sometime during one of those three messages, God's going to speak it through me. God's going to pull out a passage from the Bible, and I'm going to hit on it. It's going to help you. But if you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you a prescription, you go to Walmart, you go to the pharmacy, you get it for you get a prescription fulfilled. By the way, we have medicines to get pick up. We have medicines at the Walmart you gotta pick up. What is no I wish my I wish this would help out? Well, have you taken the medicine? Well, no. Okay, so you've gone to the doctor, yes. He gave you a prescription, yes. You went to Walmart and got it filled, yes, but you didn't pick it up. Oh yeah, I picked it up. Where is it at? It's on my medicine cabinet. Have you opened it up and taken it? No. You want God to help you? Okay, are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you coming to church? Are you coming to church every service? 
I'm not talking about people who have to work. That's messed up. I understand that. I'm talking about you don't come to church on purpose. You got, th- you got better things to do. Really? You got better things to do than go to church? No, you don't. And then the very thing is you need help with in your Christian life, there it is. Well, we're thankful today. We're, we're independent Baptists, and we've somehow merged with the rest of, you know, we're new independent, we're new IFB. We've merged somehow from the rest of the world that we don't need to go to church anymore. Pastor Anderson's done preached on it. All you got to go to is YouTube.com and type in the search bar, what you, it's topic, and sure enough, pop, there it is. Go to Faithful Word Baptist, FWBC or FaithfulWordBaptistChurch.org or whatever. He's preached on it. Find the link. There it is. You don't have to wait to go to church. It's all right there in your living room. You don't got to go to church. Pastor Anderson's already preached on it. No, go to church, be accountable to the person face-to-face with the people in the pews face-to-face and get that. I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know that. But how many times we need something from the Lord and we don't come to the church and get it? Lord, I wish you'd speak to my heart about this. Lord, help me see what I'm supposed to do. And the Lord's like, okay, I've got a mouthpiece at the church. And I prepared him, I prepared something for you with that. Well, you're going to have to get to the church house. You're going to have to get to the church house and get that. That's why church is so important. So, you know, look at the thing that God gives us. Look at the, look at the deliverance that God has. You know, he gives us deliverance. We have to live by faith. Living by faith includes this. Number one, a recognition of, superior, the, the recognition of God's superiority. When God leads, his way is superior. He, he's, got, he's an awesome manager of resources. God is, we got to recognize God's management, recognize God's super, superior, superior, superiority of management. Number two, recognize the consequence of not trusting God. When we don't trust God, we're falling on our own devices. We're scheming. We're not trusting him. Number three, we need to recognize God's perception. He knows our thoughts are far off. He knows our uprising and down sittings. He knows tomorrow. He's already tomorrow. He's already there. Yesterday, today, forever. He's already there. You don't think God knows what we need tomorrow? You don't think God knows what we need tomorrow, the next minute? Sure he does. We need to recognize God's perception. He knows what's best. Number four, we need to recognize, um, we need to recognize that both entrapment and deliverance are in God's hands. You want to get out of the trouble? Look to God. If you go by your own devices, you'll go into a snare every time. Deliverance and entrapment are in God's hands. God sets a snare. Look what it says in verse number, in verse number, Psalms 141, verse number, verse number nine. Keep me from the snares which have which they have laid for me, and the gins of the workers of iniquity. That's not talking about gins like card games or alcohol. Okay, that's the devices. That's the crafty work and works of traps of, of the of the enemy. He's saying. Keep me from these things. Look at verse number 10. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst I with all escape. While I'm escaping from the, from the snare, let them fall in it. God is capable of keeping you from the snare while letting the enemy fall in the snare. So we, if we recognize God in his ways, if we don't recognize God in his ways, we're going to be caught into a snare every time. We're going to be caught into it. We're going to get our foot in a hold. We're going to get into a pit. We're going to fall by the wayside. We're going, to get our, we're going to get ourselves in mess. We need to trust God and live by faith. What is faith? Faith is realizing what God, who God is and trusting in how he operates. That's living by faith. So when you come to trouble, I hope you can sit back and say to yourself, I'm going to seek the Lord's help. I'm going to ask for the Lord's help. I'm not going to do it my own self. I'm going to I'm going to keep myself from sin. I'm going to seek out godly counsel. I'm going to ask for advice. I'm going to ask for counsel. I'm going to let God be my, I'm going to let God judge my enemy. I'm not going to take it upon myself. And I'm going to keep on going by faith. That's our response to trouble. And you sit back and say, I just feel so empty. But yeah, you look back and say, I'm so empty, but I'm so full. Because I'm empty of myself, but I'm full of God's presence and full of God's provisions, full of God's power and full of God's mercy. That's the two choices you have today but it's all reacts on our prayer life. I encourage you to develop that prayer life. I encourage you to spend time together as a family to pray with one another. I encourage you single guys, get together and just start praying. I encourage you guys to pray. I encourage you to have such a strong prayer life that supersedes anything else. Prayer life. Daniel wasn't known for going and reading his Bible every day. Daniel was known for praying every day. 
We need to be, we need to dare to be like that and pray every time we get a chance. Let's go ahead and ask God's blessing on our, on our fellowship and over our departure, asking God's for traveling mercies.